Welcome everyone to this week's Hello. learning space. Hi, <laughs> my name is Nicole Gallucci. I am a postdoc with CosmoQuest, uh, and I am joined today by our formal education lead, Georgia Bracey. Hello. Hi. And our curriculum developer, Ellen Riley. Hello, everybody. Um, so which this week, we wanted to talk about a couple things, mainly uh, the NSTA conference. We just came back from in San Antonio. It's the National Science Teachers Association. Talk about some of the interesting, cool stuff we presented and or saw there at the conference. Um, I have lots of pictures of animals. So cute. <laughs> um, and uh, talk a little bit about the next-gen science standards. Uh, those standards were released the night before we flew out for the conference. Something somewhat crazy like that. Um, so <laughs> Somewhat ridiculous. But uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that and how that impacted things at NSTA. Um, and show off our swag a little bit. Um, first, instead of a hands-on demo, um, I would like to share a cool, interesting TV show that I learned about at NSTA. Um, it's called Psy Girls. Here's a little bookmark they gave me. So it's pbskids.org slash scigirls. And it is a show geared towards uh, getting girls interested in science. And I popped over to the website um, and was very excited that everything wasn't pink. Not that I have anything against pink, obviously, but <laughs> so much of what you see for let's get girls interested in science is, is a little overly pink. Um, so here's the, the website you can... This is what the website looks like, and I was all excited because there's a penguin nice. in the truck. Um, but it's a PBS series. Um, they have games and stuff on their website, so I encourage you to check that out. Are they um, um, targeting a certain age with that, Nicole? Can you tell? I don't know. I want to say elementary, it's maybe a into middle I school. It looks yeah, yeah. I know. I know the the actresses that they have in there are kind of junior high age. Um, that do the voices and whatnot. Um, so yeah, check that out. Sci Girls. I have a little Sci Girl pin that they gave me as well. It's got a ruler on it, but it's not in metric. Wait, it is metric. Yay, metric ruler on it. Ah, awesome. So instead of a hands-on activity, I would encourage you to go play on their website and check out their show. So uh, that's all I have for that. Um, man, not sure where to start. <laughs> Start with what you guys did down at uh, NSTA, because I still haven't heard all the all the fun details. But uh, who who went and what kinds of things you guys were presenting? How many times? Six, seven, eight different venues and things. So start there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we did a bunch of sessions uh, on Terra Luna, which is our uh, curriculum that we've developed to go along with the Moon Mappers uh, website and citizen science project. And so that's a middle school level unit that Ellen and, and Kathy Costello have developed uh, along with Georgia. And I, I threw something at it too, I think. <laughs> that kind of worked. Something's right. Something's right. Something very good. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, we presented that. Um, we shared it at a couple of sessions. They did a Nesta share That's the National Earth Science Teachers. Association. Association. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we shared it there. We shared it with the NASA wavelength session. Uh, we shared. We did our own session. So what we did was the we did the crater activity, which involves. Uh, and have you ever seen us do this on the Hangout before? But it involves blasting a pan full of uh, flour and cocoa powder with some kind of projectile. And I got some really great video of our of our workshop participants. Uh, just blowing cocoa powder all over the place with their with their asteroid impacts. So I'll put that together at some point. Um, let me pull up a picture if I can. Yeah, this is the uh, table covered in cocoa powder. It's, it's ejecta all the way down, you guys. It's just cocoa powder everywhere, all over wow, people's that clothing. That is a nice size crater. Yeah, <laughs> that was probably the tallest drop. That was, I believe that was the golf ball from uh, two <laughs> meters, meters and with a little velocity. There was some velocity in that one. <laughs> in that one so yeah, they got super into that. Um, we didn't go fully through the measuring process, um, but we wanted to give them an idea, and they they uh, could immediately tell 
um, the differences that the velocity and the height would show, uh, how you would, how you'd probably want a bigger pan than that in your classrooms. So you can actually count up the ejector rates, <laughs> and they don't go across the table or the floor, whatever you're doing there. Um, I want to pause real quick because I always forget to say this. Uh, if you want a comment or question uh, on what we're talking about, there are several places you can do that. If you are watching on the YouTube channel, you can uh, check that. You can leave a comment there. If you're watching on Google Plus on the event page, you can comment there. I see Andrew is commenting at us. Hello. Mm -hmm. um, if you are watching anywhere else on Google Plus, we should get that as well, as I've hit all the shared sources, I think. Um, and if you're watching somewhere else and want to comment or question, use the hashtag learning space on Twitter. So you can reach us any of those ways. Um, oh, gosh. What else did we do? OK, uh, so um, you gave a talk. I gave a talk. Right. I gave a pretty pretty standard, here's what citizen science is, and here's how you can use it in your classroom, and um, just gave them an overview of the Terra Luna unit. Uh, so the Terra Luna unit being a three-week, I think with assessment, it's like three weeks? It's three weeks. Right, OK. It's it's three three weeks. Weeks. You go all the way through. <laughs> yeah. well, well, ultimately, it would be wonderful to be able to go all the way through. However, if um, you don't have that amount of time, you can pick and choose activities that you think would be more meaningful or most meaningful for your students. And uh, we've arranged it that way. Pre-tests, post-tests, uh, quizzes, other assessments. Um, and you can look at those tests. And if you've only done a few units, you can pick and choose the questions you would like to use from those, those tests that we've already prepared or prepare your own. And uh, here's another activity I have a picture of. Um, we had one called Earth or Not Earth. Uh, and this is how you start off your, your unit um, by giving your students a bunch of black and white images from the Earth and the Moon. Hang on, the screen share button went away. There you are. Um, so, so, again, thank you to our lovely participants, all of who gave me permission to use their <laughs> pictures and video on the intertubes. Um, but uh, this is, so we give them a bunch of black and white images and, you know, ask them to decide, is that the Earth or is that the Moon? Um, you can expand it if you were doing a whole planetary science thing, but we're sticking with Earth and Moon for this unit. Um, and, and, and even at the table, the teachers got really competitive um, about who was, who was, you know, getting the right answers and actually... Uh, uh, sorting them properly. Yeah, and the neat thing is that it also encourages students to um, back up their choices with yes. uh, some good uh, reasons and arguments. So there's a lot of scientific discussion that ends up happening. And I don't know if you guys heard any of that with the teachers. Oh, where we they did. Given yeah. some good reasons. Mm -hmm. We did actually, which is what I was what I was actually looking for. And I'm and it gives you an idea with your students how much prior knowledge they have. What are they? Yes. What do they see? In that picture, one of the teachers said, "I think that's Earth because I'm thinking that that's snow and the top." And it was. And we had a big discussion about whether to include that photo for students. And I thought, yes, we need to because I'm looking for a student to make that observation, and because that means that they're observing, they're really looking closely, and then they have a reason to give. I think this is Earth because, uh, not not I think this is Earth because. Well, although it might be okay to say this is the Barringer crater, I know because I was there with my parents, mm -hmm. and that would be okay. A lot of people will say, "Oh, wait, I've been there." No, I've been there, and that, and that's okay too yeah. because then you have some you you know they do have some prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we chose those pictures for reasons. Some of them are not easy. Mm. Uh, teachers did not get them all right, even considering that they've been teaching Earth science and space science. They would get a couple wrong, and um, that was interesting. They didn't like getting them wrong either. <laughs> but I think they liked learning something <laughs> from that. They did, and we actually used that at some of the, the other sessions. The share are when yeah. we were standing by the table, people were fascinated by that activity. Yeah. They, would, they would flip the pictures up, because we do have the answers on the back. And they would they would try to put them in piles first and then flip them over. Everybody was, it was into that one very simple, good activity to engage your students right off the bat. And then we also took them through uh, the mapping, the crater age activity that uh, we came up with along with the Moon Mappers Lunar Scientists. Um, and, and at the end of that activity, which is, I think it's a two-day activity really, you have your students marking craters on black and white images of the moon. Well, black and white to save on ink doesn't really matter. <laughs> but uh, you, you have them mark craters on the moon with a marker. 
and then count how many craters are in each image, you put them together to make a larger picture and use the crater counts to determine the relative age of the surface. And so you actually see there's something of some, somewhat of a gradient happening here between a surface that has fewer craters to a surface that has, has more craters. And so we, we, uh, we did that twice, I think. We had one group do it, and then we had the other group correct them, <laughs> correct their craters, because <laughs> mm -hmm. the first group was a bit rushed for time. Mm -hmm. um, and so both we, groups thoroughly enjoyed it. it. It was an activity that none of them had seen mm -hmm. before because it's uh, an activity. Because we made it up. We pulled it out of our yes. noses. <laughs> like the, and the picture activity they had not seen before either mm -hmm. because that's another one we made up. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was all of our stuff, pretty much. Uh, unless I'm missing something, Ellen. We did do a cafe. We did do a cafe. Uh, did a cafe a format. We had envisioned that people would show up, and just like in Paris, when Hemingway and all of his intelligent people were ha hanging around and drinking wine and discussing wonderful ideas, we thought we would get them um, no wine, but get them discussing um, wonderful Andy. ideas about science, the challenges <laughs> about teaching science, the kind of technology they had available in the classroom, how much they could engage their kids with, with technology, what citizen science had they done, share websites they'd used, and uh, we had the papers covering the tables with markers so they could write on the tables like they were in a cafe. And sadly, we did not get enough people yeah. to really make this a meaningful mm -hmm. session because you really need to have several tables and uh, have a, you know, throw out a question brief, yeah. and have them share their ideas and have, have a report after 10 minutes, have a reporter from each table share what their table has come mm -hmm. up with. We had one table with, a, you know, a few people that were having a good discussion, but it just really did not turn out the way we had envisioned. Yeah, and but Ellen, Ellen, you totally wore the awesome Oh, hat but I did. <laughs> oh, you yeah. are. And there I am. And there you are with the coolest hat. <laughs> so somebody, yeah, somebody came up to me and said, I want to see who the Harry Potter lady is. Said, well, actually, when I was teaching, I did use that as a sorting hat in my classroom yeah. for the lab group. Oh, okay. That's a great picture. I hadn't yes. seen that one. You hadn't seen me no, either. I haven't seen any of these pictures first yet. First time for me. Well, they haven't been posted yet. This, no. this is my iPhoto library. I just uploaded them yesterday. You got them all. Oh, yeah. I do have them all. Um, so in addition, a small group though at NSTA, maybe talk about the scope of the event because I don't know how many even teachers oh get to the national there were between conference and there's just so much. Yeah. And I was going to address that where the cafe then, was concerned yeah. too. There are between fifteen and twenty thousand teachers at this mm -hmm. conference on uh, on any given day because while it lasts four days, some come in for the entire conference, some come in for two days, some come in for one day, uh, depending upon when their schools will release them. And yeah. uh, there are a lot of sessions held. There's a lot to choose from. So I was disappointed yeah. with the cafe, but there mm -hmm. was a lot to choose from at that particular time slot. Mm -hmm. Every, and, and from what I've heard, that's standard for pretty yeah. much all those sessions like that. It is. It's very yeah. rare to have one that's super crowded um, because there is so much going on. Very often the super crowded ones are the vendors, the ones that <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> away Logical might do and so on. The, and, and one of the reasons is that they give away lots of free stuff. Mm -hmm. and. You know, Sorry, that. we can't afford that. We gave you stickers. Oh, and they I think we gave you themselves. We gave you yeah. Yes. Yeah. And right. then there's the big expo hall too. Yeah. Just all the booths. So a mm -hmm. lot of times people are uh, walking from booth to booth, looking at all the great stuff oh, yeah. and getting all the free things they can carry and all that. <laughs> I got a little bit. Oh. I worked primarily at the NASA uh, Science Mission Directorate booth. Um, which, of course, sadly, given uh, sequester concerns, may not exist after this. Um, which stinks because they have a they just had this huge table full of educational resources for every grade level. So I picked up a, a cool poster that you know has some elementary school activities on the back. I picked up uh, some information on a cloud citizen science project in Spanish. I got a new Horizon sticker from somebody. I don't remember who actually gave me that. And then a DVD, Journey to the Stars. So they had, that was just a tiny sampling of, of all the stuff that they had just at that one table. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff to do and a lot of ways to spend your time. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that's probably just in the convention. I'm sure there's a few things to do there outside are, the convention. There are off-site so. things as well. Mm -hmm. I, I know that some of the SeaWorld is down there, and they did go to swim with the belugas and people. And uh, that would be tempting, whether you're a biology teacher or a oh, science yeah. teacher. Mm -hmm. That might be a tempting thing to do for an afternoon. So. Well, yeah. I mean, SeaWorld <laughs> was right next to the NASA booth. So, of course, we were just having a blast. So, I, I got you to pet a flamingo. Oh. And <laughs> you should match your hair color to that. And, and I got to meet some been. penguins, mm -hmm. <laughs> which has nothing to do with astronomy. But you're right. There are some you attractions that you just, you just can't resist. But they it's, also, it's wonderful. They and, and, you know, about twice a day they walk in the <laughs> A lemur? Is that yes. a lemur? It's a lemur from Madagascar. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No more animal pictures. <laughs> <laughs> it's science. It's fine. It's science. science. So it's a great time. It's a great time. Now, uh, from what I understand from you guys, the ones on the East Coast are a little better attended because it's just the population density. You tend to get people that drive um, to these conferences because it's hard to get airfare or days off um, for mm -hmm. teachers. And right. so if they can drive for in for a day, you get more people. And so the next one is in Boston next April. Mm -hmm. um, so there might be an actual, um, a larger crowd even for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But sorry, the abstract deadline was Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it comes up pretty fast. Comes up really fast. Comes up really fast. Um, anything else particular at the meeting, Ellen, that, that struck you? Other than NGSS, because that gets its own. Well, the, it, that that is, um, yeah, that's important. Um, no, not uh, not really. Um, mm -hmm. a, you know, I, I will mention this. What I liked about sitting down once eating, grabbing something to eat, and what I did find exciting is people would walk by, and they were so excited about things. I mean, oh, it, I was eavesdropping. Imagine mm -hmm. that. And um, and I mean, they were saying they were saying things like, "Well, when I went to this session, this is what they said, and I was able to make this this volcano, or or we had these DNA beads, and we were able to construct this. And this, these are the bits and pieces of conversation that I was getting, yeah. and I wanted so to be able to to record it actually, and and show show the public that teachers are here." and they're working sure they're having fun sure they're on the boat and the river in the evening and so on but they're also there because they're excited about science and excited about what they can learn and take home to their kids yeah there's so many great practical things that teachers can get at a conference like this and they can go back and they can use it the next week in their class which I know is what most teachers um, tend to want they want those practical things that will help them right away and, and like picking up resources, that. yeah, they like yeah. picking up, you know, things they can do in the class. Um, like you said, the vendors giving away freebies, they, they like picking that up. Because <laughs> that's fun. If I was a teacher, I totally would have done that, but I felt kind of bad, which I, like I shouldn't take things, because I wouldn't actually use it except for my own enjoyment. Oh, I had to refrain from that, because I yeah. used to be a profession of that, you know, I, would, I could leave with 30 pencils, all enough for my whole class, but um, I did not do that this time. I did occasionally pick up something mm -hmm. that I thought would be very good for my grandchildren, <laughs> because... <laughs> They are That's very good in yeah. science. Now, I mean, education. The, it is it's education. So. So. Um, I should point out I did get a mission patch from Project Mercury, not spelled the way you'd expect it to be. Uh, if you go to spacemicrobes.org, that's another citizen science project. Um, but I got a mission patch from them, where they're they're sampling microbes uh, all all around uh, on the ISS and then also all around the world. And, and then they're doing this cool project. Uh, they've got several different science goals that they're reaching. And then they've got this one project where they're pitting microbes from different stadiums around the U.S. Mm. against each other in this, like, bracket sort of thing. <laughs> I don't know how the sports ball works. Um, oh, on the International Space Station, so they're going to have microbes from stadiums fighting out in space. Um, so so, yeah, anyway, they're also developing educational materials to go along with that. So go to spacemicrobes.org. Um, that was a really fun presentation that I got root to see. Go root for your microbe team. Great. Yes, go root for your microbe team. How how cool is that? I said I said this should totally replace the pup. I mean, I love the puppy bowl, but 
<laughs> I would love to see this mm. be another Super Bowl alternative. Yeah, try it. Yeah. Microbe wars. Okay. Um. So one of the big topics at at and at NSTA was the NGSS. We're we're sitting in alphabet soup here. Um. So maybe Ellen, you should give the overview of what is NGSS. I think you know better than George or I. NGSS is yeah. Generation Science Standards, and um. You know, it's it's no secret that there have been science standards, and uh, in every state, and many of them are different. And they're trying. The a National Research Council got together to to um, oh a couple about uh, twenty uh, two thousand nine two thousand ten to come up with a frameworks for different subject matters, including science. What do we think that children should know and uh, to be scientifically literate essentially uh, not to be prepared not only to be prepared for college but to be good citizens what do they need to know to uh, um, go out in the job to go to college be good at their jobs to be responsible citizens who can vote on issues when they come up because there are many scientific issues involving ecology and space travel and so on and uh, they have to vote on these things sometimes and they have to vote for people who will vote on these things in Congress and mm -hmm. it's, it's essential that they understand it. so they got together and made a framework of what they thought was essential then from the frame the frameworks were finished about 2011 and then uh, about 41 states contributed people to write the next generation science standards and those to, from the frameworks and not you don't have to you do not have to adopt them. I think approximately twenty six states have adopted these, and they are linked to the core curriculum. They are linked to core to core. Or they are not current. They're not. It's if you pull them up right now, the, the links current there, draft, the current be, final draft, which is it's, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. So. Um, what else can I tell you? The the they are basically the frameworks. Should we talk about the frameworks first? Well, they sure. Are How are they structured? In, yeah. They're structured okay. in three dimensions. And the yeah. first dimensions, uh, the first dimension is practices, which we used to call way back in the day process skills. The skills the kids have to they need to know to do science. Uh, the second dimension is cross cutting concepts, and it's concepts that have have application across all domains of science. And um, it's a different way of linking different domains of science, uh, including patterns and similarities and diversity and cause and effect and things like that. Yep. And the third dimension um, is uh, disciplinary core ideas. And basically, it focuses on the power of, of K-12 science curriculum instruction and assessments. Um, and, uh, you know, it has a... a a significant it's significant it's supposed to appeal to the interests of the students the experience of the students and um, the thing that's important and what what the NGSS has taken from this is that uh, basically we need fewer topics and greater depth mm -hmm. because we can teach we can't teach all the facts we just need I mean how can you know everything and you don't need to anymore you, don't need, <laughs> you do need to know how to access them. Mm -hmm. You need to know enough to know the keywords and, and you do need, do need to know how to do the research to get your answers. But the process is very important and uh, it's important, it's very important for kids to be able to do inquiry and to, you know years ago what happened was first they were reading it out of a book then the next thing was hands-on. We we're all going to do hands-on things and that was great but hands-on had essentially an answer. We were giving them the problem and we knew what the answer was going to be. Now we now the next step that and we started this maybe fifteen years ago, so it's kind of surprise was kind of surprising to me that they still are insisting that oh my gosh this is a brand new thing and and that teachers aren't doing it because I think a lot of teachers are doing it. But the, the next step was inquiry and that is let's have the kids ask a question and Answer and then go through the process of uh, of designing an experiment and answer it. How would I how would I answer this question? Just like a scientist, have them be real scientists, because this is a skill not only used in science; it's used in everyday life. It's a problem-solving skill. 
and it's a skill that's going to help them make decisions about their life, not just science. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is the whole thinking behind next generation uh, science standards. So if anybody want to jump in here, anyone that might, have I kind of given a good background of what the whole Yeah, is? My, my understanding is that um, there's 26 states that have decided they're going to adopt it at mm -hmm. this point, but there is a lot of strong hope from the drafters of the standards that it will become a national movement over the next few decades. Um, I think I have a little map here of the states that are leading it, mm -hmm. the development, and it's a total checkerboard. I remember looking at this going, this doesn't make sense, it doesn't make obvious political boundaries, it doesn't you know, hit obvious geographical boundaries, but as you guys pointed out to me, I think, um, this map follows along with a certain educational consortium mm -hmm that started the movement um, so if you have if you want a quick look I grabbed this image uh, I need to point out I grabbed this image from the skeptical teacher blog um, Matt Lowry who who blogs on all kinds of science and skeptical topics uh, posted this image which is where I first saw it um, the blue states are the ones adopting the NGSS and the white states are the ones that have not yet <laughs> depending on how optimistic you want to be um, and tell us the um, website um, do you have the NGSS I think yeah it Sorry. It's nextgenscience.org, mm -hmm. and I've put that up in the event mm -hmm. comments, and I'll put it in the YouTube yeah. description at the end. So next, find all of that stuff plus yeah. download the standards themselves mm -hmm. in a couple of different ways. You can uh, just Google right NGSS; yeah. it'll take yeah. you there. The website. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that'll and, give you uh, all the details. Also, I pulled something up this afternoon because I, I wanted to be able to maybe make some intelligent comment tonight. But uh, no, more than that, I pulled it up because I was interested in uh, the international community as well. And in mm -hmm. developing this, there was a group uh, called Achieve, and I'm not exactly sure what, which group it is, but they did an international study using 10 countries that are related, closely related to the United States, either... Um, because they are top scorers on international tests or because we they are closely uh, allied to us. And the research showed that in te te 12 model countries, they have integrated science standards, which is what NGSS is doing. There actually is an emphasis on physical science and physics in all these countries. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And in the bio life sciences, they emphasize the social significance of life science, which I thought was interesting. Mm. All of these countries uh, are into cross-cutting content, content that's common to all the sciences, and they emphasize the ability of students to plan and carry out an investigation, which is mm. what this is about, too. We're interested in content to a certain extent, but we're interested in inquiry, mm. practice, and content as they go together. So they're also interested in making science available to all student populations all student populations in these countries had access to science so those that's part of what they were thinking when they were putting the next gen standards together okay. and it sound, sounded good to me mm -hmm. okay. and a lot of what I heard we had um, a speaker here on campus talking about the next gen standards is they they hear the they they heard the cry of teachers saying we don't just want to teach facts we want to teach inquiry we want to do these kind of things and so the standards were built towards that um, and so that that's a really positive thing for those of us who who shake our fist uh, wearily at <laughs> the state of science education in the U S ah oh, they're just teaching the facts and the test um, these standards were built with that in mind let's teach how to do science well, now of course how to test that. Hmm? We, know, we know so much more now about how students learn science yes. than they did two and three generations ago. They, I mean, they, we just know that uh, children just remember it more if they can do it. We, we remember it more if we're doing it, if we're made to think about it, if we're made to come up with a question ourselves. And, and it's, uh, and then kind of makes sense. I mean, it seems obvious right now, but evidently it wasn't two generations ago, but it is rather right. obvious now. So. Right. And there's a lot of um, engineering concepts that go into it as well. Speaking of yeah, doing I was going to say that's kind of a new feature. And um, Ellen mentioned those disciplinary core ideas. Um, so there's four of them, and engineering, um, as well as technology and applied or applications of science, is one 
core idea along with the life sciences and earth and space science and physical science. So you actually have engineering sort of rising up and taking a pretty major, you know, equal role um, or place in amongst all the other typical content for science. So the process of engineering as content itself mm -hmm. is kind of a new thing. So, you know, that's something that's one of the things that I think a lot of teachers are wondering about is, you know, this really is kind of new. I'm sure there was, you know, there was engineering here and there, um, but it's, it's more predominant now with these standards. And so, um, and, but, and there's a lot of good stuff out there, though, to uh, help teachers put some engineering into their curriculum. So, but that's a new thing. Actually, that is very new. That is correct because they used to distinguish that. Well, this is science, like pure science, and then the engineers take what the scientists discover and, and they just use it. They apply it. Well, now there's a new way of looking at that. It's you know, scientists do, or in, in the pure sciences, they come up with uh, investigations and they investigate a problem, but uh, the engineers have to also uh, are presented with a problem and then they have to come with a uh, come up with a design or model to solve that problem. So it is very, it's, it's in, very integral. They're, they're very closely related, mm -hmm. and that is now recognized. Yeah, that scientific thinking is, mm -hmm. is key to both. Exactly. Yeah, they're really close. Mm -hmm. They're very much related. So we're bringing, so, you know, STEM is the buzzword these days, right? STEM. STEM. Uh, <laughs> so new sticky notes. You know, so we've got, so M, math has its own standards, right? The core curriculum. Um, Right, that this is part of the they have their own standards, and they yeah. are highly, they are definitely linked to mm -hmm. uh, to and to next gen. I mean, it's there. They, yeah. you don't wait for it; it's right there, right now. And then now S has its own standards, and we're saying that T and E are being highly featured in the science standards, and so we're really bringing the whole STEM <laughs> STEM <laughs> bit in, into the classroom. And there are what's you know there are technology standards, and I have to admit, I kind of would think there's probably engineering of some sort for education out there, but I don't really know. I don't know how to live here. But I know there's tech standards as well. So, um, you know, there's a lot already out there, and that's, you know, part of the struggle that teachers have is, you know, there's so many standards in so many different places, and, you know, what do you do? You know, yeah. What do you do when you get to your class every day, you know? And that, some of that is filtered through when it comes down to the um, state, district, or local level as to how that all plays out in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, but there is certainly, you know, a whole lot of standards out there. And so now we have another set. <laughs> well, yeah, and when you're as old as I am, you have been through several sets. As mm -hmm. I say to people, I've been through I gap, I set, I quit. So that's that's what happened to me. <laughs> not, but not really. I'm no, nope, you're still here. <laughs> I'm still here. You looking don't at, quit. No, I don't ever quit. Here I am looking at more standards and and. She's, and her retirement is creating curricula for these lovely people. <laughs> uh, I want to remind you guys, if you're watching, um, you can comment on YouTube, on Google+, uh, anywhere this is broadcasting, and we will see your comments and questions. Uh, also use the hashtag learning space on Twitter, and we'll see that as well. Um, and, and feel free to share the link uh, and share the video after it's posted with your, your teacher friends. I'd love to get more feedback. Um, Speaking of feedback, um, Ellen, did you get a sense at the conference from other teachers, or do you both, from talking to people in general over the last couple of years, get a sense of what teachers are doing to get ready for NGSS, or how they feel about it being implemented? Well, the teachers that I'm, uh, I've had conversation with mostly are the middle school teachers. That's where I, I taught. And uh, they were caught up really in the core curriculum initially, mm -hmm. with Next Gen being kind of a secondary thought for them you know they were there they knew it was coming um the ones that i have talked to are very excited about uh okay. about the inquiry they've been one actually was very sad because two years ago because we've been a little slow let's face it with the next gen mm -hmm. you know it was supposed to come out two years ago and so because it did not come out the uh, core standards came out for science and they were core standards for science literacy. So a lot of the schools then started uh, putting pressure on the teachers to read, just 
just read in science because the core standards said there, there were basically literacy standards and you read them and they, my, my friends are saying, no, we have fought so hard to get inquiry in the classroom, we're going to sneak it in anyway. So now, of course, they don't have to sneak it in, it's, it's going to be linked and they're excited about that. So the core standards, to clarify, are math and language, language arts? Mm -hmm. Primarily, okay. I put a link to that. That's just core standards. Mm -hmm. org. Is that being adopted widely across the U.S. or is that similar in that it's like half and half, like NGSS? My impression is that it's like half and half. Okay. It's like half and half as well because there are some states that are just you know they're looking at them very closely. Mm -hmm. um, there are um, issues with some of the things that are included in the core standards that the states may not um, believe should be taught and so on which is always the case. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a problem. And um, education after in the United States is not federally controlled. I mean, we get federal input, we have, have grants and that kind of thing, but it is more, uh, the control is more on a local level. Well, that's why these are all .org websites, not .gov. I mean, these are yeah. independent boards of teachers exactly. and educators that have come together to, to come up with these standards. And in fact, uh, and when I pulled this up this afternoon, it said, and I'll just read you from it, it said, the creation of NGSS was entirely state-driven with no federal funds or incentives to create or adopt the standards. Mm -hmm. So it is a, a statewide. So even though we say U.S. standards, that's not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a comment from Ted Willard that says, Common Core has been adopted by 46 states. Wow. That's yeah. almost 50. That's almost 50. <laughs> that's Yay. Nice. Well, that sounds good. Awesome. Awesome. So that, that's a much higher acceptance rate than we thought. Um, yeah, and, and hopefully, I mean, since they already, you know, they do tie in to the NGSS when they're looking for science standards, hopefully they'll pick that up um, because that allows you to, to cover both in, in a lot of ways. And I know um, the Terra Luna lesson plans you guys came up with uh, all have links to the NGSS. Uh, they have some additional activities that hit Common Core, and then there are some other standards. I know there's internationally there, there's another set of standards that seems to be, be becoming popular. Uh, uh, projects uh, twenty Project twenty sixty one that has been around for a long time is used in the international community. These are these are benchmarks that have been set set up, and it's twenty sixty one after Halley's comment. Is that comment? Is that how you? Oh call it? yes, that's why it's twenty sixty one. Do not know that. Uh, that has been around for a while and the international community is using it so we did align it to that mm -hmm. and also uh, National Science Education Standards and SES it is also aligned to that. And SES is the US right? Yeah, that is okay. US. The current ones. Um, the whole idea is that as I am I'm retired from the classroom but I know how how much time it takes to teach you know for me in middle school, maybe 130 kids a year and interface with the students and the parents and so on. And, and you know you should align your, your curriculum to standards and it takes a huge amount of time to look for them. So if you can present the teachers with curriculum that you and you can show them where it's already aligned, they are thrilled to get that. They don't have to go searching and, and proving that they are teaching to the standards. Yeah, I, I have my friends in Virginia, Dark Skies Bright Kids, have been putting together activity activity lesson plans um, for hands-on astronomy activities, and Virginia is not one of the states adopting NGSS, so they've been um, aligning them to the Virginia standards of learning, the uh, the <laughs> hilariously acronymed SOLs, um, <laughs> and, and I think we're gonna <laughs> one thing we're gonna we're gonna try and align those to the NGSS as well, so that, um, we can reach more people, but. You know, if more people adopt NGSS, it makes it a little easier to create these lesson plans. It can be used, you know, you an anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Make our jobs easier. A lot easier. <laughs> so, but even a lot of, so Terra Luna was created um, before the standards actually were released. Mm -hmm. They were just released about a week ago. Um, but the framework was there, and so currently, you know, they are aligned with the framework, um, but we'll actually have to do a little more tweaking um, mm -hmm. on Terra Luna, it's that now that the standards themselves are finally out after going through a couple of drafts mm -hmm. and public comment, um, you know, just to take another look and probably just add some details in there. Um, now that everything's finalized and out to the public, so. Now, I would like to add also that, uh, actually, sadly, there aren't as many standards for 
earth science and space science as I would like to see. Yes. There. Uh, and, and even less for space science all, yeah. than earth science. Mm -hmm. And and that makes me sad. And, and kids uh, like space. I mean, come well, on. You know what? My I always tell people, hey, you know, what do, what are three things kids love? Dinosaurs, whales, and space. Rockets. You know. I, I TA'd a class in undergrad. It was a freshman seminar. It was about dinosaurs and rockets. It was basically let's relive our favorite childhood things. We're going to talk about dinosaurs and rockets, and it was just the coolest class. <laughs> that was college level. <laughs> so yes. I love more it. dinosaurs, more space, and and kids will love you. Yeah. Uh, I found the graphic of how many states have adopted the Common Core right on their website. Fantastic. Um, looks like about they say forty five plus several Wonderful. territories. Um, and uh, so the yellow have adopted the Common Core in language arts and math. The orange have not. Virginia, come on! Oh, look at that. <laughs> Spent seven years living in you. What? What are you doing? <laughs> Alaska. Yeah. Alaska, Minnesota. Minnesota. Well, we'll, see. we'll see. Minnesota. Yeah. Minnesota. <laughs> I gotta say. Yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. Well, my daughter lives up there. I'm gonna have to call her. Not that she <laughs> say, Why are you living in that state? <laughs> yeah. So although the, the science standards have been on their way for quite a long time, mm -hmm. really, and the districts and teachers know that they're coming, um, most people have been dealing with Common Core implementation, um, oh. just because that kind of got, you know, that was first, um, that got there quicker. Um, but they've known that this is coming with the new science standards, and in, in some way I heard a teacher say that, you know, watching the adoption and what people are going through with Common Core has kind of paved the way for or, you know, what may happen in a way with next-gen standards. So they've been, you know, a lot of teachers and districts have been through an adoption process of a new set of standards, and, and maybe the new science standards will be a little easier. Is that good or that. bad? Well, I mean, I did it know. go well or not? I guess is the I question. It totally depends on where you're teaching at this okay. point. Okay. Uh, but, you know, um, now that they're out, you know, districts will take a more, you know, look a serious look at, at the next gen standards because they're here finally here they exist. But another big question too um, is how they will be um, how assessment will look with the standards oh yeah so that is really still uh, yet to come there's lots of ideas and lots of things kind of in the works and going on with that but um, you know the standards are one big step but um, what the assessments are going to be mm -hmm that show how those standards are remember, not maybe implemented. That's a whole other story. That's I remember when I was in fourth grade, we had some state test in, in New York. And I don't remember much, except I remember they took us all down to the gym, and they had all these little experiments set up, and we had, you know, a time limit at each one, and we had to do these little experiments and fill out little lab reports. Is that the kind of thing that we'd be moving to? We're moving away from bubble sheets and towards this little setup. Well, ultimately, that would be a wonderful thing, and Illinois tried to do that with mm -hmm. uh, I, I, the IGAP, I was making a joke before, but IGAP standards did involve two dimensions, and mm -hmm. the first dimension was content, the bubble, you know, where you have to an mm -hmm. answer the content of the facts, and the second dimension that you were supposed to ha implement in your classroom and was going to be implemented on the statewide level was that exactly that kind of thing okay. where you gave them a problem for instance you give them a grew a ruler with a groove in it a marble uh, and ask them how you how they could uh, make that marble fall down how they could make it go faster and farther and that kind of thing and go for it write yourself a question mm -hmm. Tell me the variables. What's your independent variable? What's your dependent var variable? And in other words, it was process. Yeah. And I was kind of excited about that. And I had, and I developed that all in my classroom. And I had everything, mm -hmm. you know, and not just me. We were all doing this in our classrooms. And uh, it came time to present all of our data that we had collected to the state. And that's when they threw IGAP out. So <laughs> that's why. And they said, no, we're having I sat now. And one of the the reasoning part, frankly, it was expensive. And yeah. Yeah. Get, in order to get people to score that, mm -hmm. um, sure. you have all these yeah. rubrics, and you have to have three people scoring usually. Okay. You know, yeah, when you when you have an assessment like that, and it's expensive to my... pay these people to score these tests. And and Illinois said, we can't do this. Scantrons are cheaper. Yeah. Uh, scantrons are much cheaper than. Oh. 
than trying to score the this type of assessment. Now you can do it in your classroom though. Yeah, you can do it in the classroom. You do it in your classroom. But the, the, where's the incentive to implement it in the classroom if their state tests are going to be bubble sheets? Yeah. Right? Well, That's no, the problem. No incentive. <laughs> well, for people who are passionate well, people who want science, to will figure out a way. Yeah, yes, we, that's true. Know, we say, okay, mm -hmm. fine. And and basically, um, and I have given um, workshops like this uh, to teachers. They wanted to know how to do well on the science tests, the mm -hmm. standardized tests. And I said, I don't know the answers. I don't know the questions. I don't know the answers. I know a certain amount is content, a certain amount is process. But I can tell you this, if you teach good science, your kids will do well on those tests. Because even if you haven't taught that particular fact, if you get kids excited about science, then they're gonna to listen to NOVA. They're gonna to listen to Animal Planet. They're gonna tune in to, to other science things. And so the facts that you weren't able to jam in their head because you didn't even know what, what to jam in their head, those, they're gonna know them because you, you made them excited about science. And if you do inquiry, they will be excited about science. And the point is to not necessarily to create a new generation of scientists. Yes, we hope some fr fraction of them will become scientists, but not everybody is going to be interested at that level. But we want everyone to have that kind of scientific thinking and be able to navigate our modern society <laughs> with, with that kind of knowledge and, and experience and process. It's your problem solver. Yeah. You just learn problem solving skills. Mm -hmm. So NGSS, we're optimistic about this. Oh, I hope so. Yeah, I have high hopes. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to share something quickly, another resource. Um, since I spent five hours at the, at the NASA table uh, sharing this with people, I will share it with you guys. Um, a little while ago, only a couple months ago, I think, um, they launched a new resource called NASA Wavelength. If you've ever gone to NASA looking for a lesson plan to go along with a certain subject, you may have gotten lost in a circle of Googling hell, trying to find something. Everything was everywhere and different projects at different sites. So now they have one website where all of the NASA approved and NASA funded products are listed. Uh, actually, you can see this little picture here uh, at, at the, at the um, this picture here that they're where they're featuring the NSTA 2013 resources, they actually have a picture from NSTA 2012 with Pamela and Georgia and Ellen and Kathy all at the NASA booth from that year. So, oh. didn't know if you knew that you guys are on the uh, NASA Wavelength oh, homepage oh, this week. That's really wild. <laughs> that is wild. <laughs> I was looking at that going, wait a second, they look familiar. Okay, I actually um, noticed Pamela there, but I didn't, yeah. Yeah, so, um, but okay, so that, that, that's the top story, uh, is the resources that were all presented at that meeting, including Terra Luna, um, but you can, uh, what's cool is you can search for resources by audience, by topic, you can enter a search term and filter by what grade level you're looking for, or you can just hover over these circles, and it tells you how many resources are available at each grade level. So if you're a middle school teacher, there are 971 resources <laughs> that you could choose from. Um, 862 for high school, uh, 789 for elementary school. So if you're a teacher looking to implement um, any any of these activities in your classroom. Multimedia down oh, lower. Yeah, they have apps. Science cast, Eclipse, cool. uh, images, yeah, all kinds of images are in here as well as lessons and activities. Um, you could even do something that's not space related. You can type in biology. And apparently my internet's slow. <laughs> there we go. 22 results on biology on a NASA website. Um, so no matter what kind of science you teach, NASA Wavelength, um, they did a really good job with this, this website, making it easy to use. Um, oh, wait, let me show one more thing. Um, on the side here is once you search for your topic, you can uh, actually look at how much time you have in the classroom that you want to spend on it. Do you have 30 minutes? Do you have six hours? Uh, how much is it going to cost you for all the materials? Um, what are the, the levels? You can just, it's just what really... Instructional strategies. What are yeah, there we go. Hands-on learning, guided inquiry. And more. Wow. <laughs> A whole lot. So they've, nice. really, they've really taken the time to, to um, 
to comb through these things. And so it's a really, and, and that's what we hear from teachers all the time is it needs to be easy to get to and simple because I have like an hour a day <laughs> or a week <laughs> to to get all to gather all these materials and get them ready or I have a limited number of time a limited amount of time um, on the um, on the computer at school to do this and so they've made it really easy to search for what you're looking for so kudos to NASA Wavelength this is why one reason why NASA education funding is so important mm. need to continue that Hint, hint, wink, wink. Uh, lots of good resources. And, you know, so you guys were at NSTA, obviously, so I guess a little plug for NSTA. Um, oh, that, yeah. That with uh, Next Gen, NSTA, along with Ellen mentioned Achieve earlier, you know, those are some of the groups that have been really instrumental in getting the standards going. Um, NSTA has tons of resources for um, understanding the Next Gen science standards, navigating your way through them, because... Well, it's it's a very exciting um, set of standards. It's not simple. It's it's also very complex. So there's lots of free webinars. There's books. There's NSTA has tons of stuff. So that would be a place to start anyway. Um, but as someone said earlier, you know, Google yeah. <laughs> next gens, and you get a lot of good Google. stuff too. But NSDA has it all kind of nicely in one place. They had a lot of sessions specifically on NGSS and understanding yeah. it. I know, Ellen, you and Kathy went to a couple of those, but uh, you already knew all the basics. So. <laughs> well, what they were well, like, we knew what they were going over, yeah. yeah. Because you have been developing the Terralona curriculum. That's you were why. familiar with them. We have been reading the different yeah. permutations of the standards. Mm -hmm. And waiting, and, and then when we would go back to find them, they were gone. <laughs> because I know <laughs> they're gone. Oh, we took them away. Yeah, because... they put the drafts out there for a while, like, teasing you, and then you know, oh, now we're done. And... I know. I emailed Georgia, going, "Where is the last draft? It's not on the website anymore." Oh, wait for the next release. Yeah. So yeah, it'll be really interesting as we go through mm -hmm. and. Um, but te like... teachers who are in the classroom right now don't have the time to peruse through draft after draft of the standards, so it's good that they have that introduction there at NSTA. And there are other regional conferences as well. Um, actually, there's a STEM Expo happening in St. Louis in May, May 17th-ish. That sounds right. I think that's a Friday. It's the I think weekend I'm not here. <laughs> One of the weekends. 15, 16, 17 yes. of May in St. Louis in St. Louis, so oh, local to us. opportunity, but there's lots of local. Um, Portland, local Charlotte, and Denver are the next three. So again, on the NSTA site, you can get mm -hmm. all that information. So yay fun. Um, so yeah, my first NSTA persons. conference, I had a lot of fun. I, If I was actually a teacher in the classroom, I would have had so much more fun collecting all the cool things and and that's fine. I came to present. I did my I did my duty. So <laughs> it's hard for for those of us who um, have switched sides <laughs> because I would read through and I'd say, oh, that would be wonderful. I could go there and I could learn to do this and then I could take it back to no, nope, I don't have a classroom <laughs> now. So that's not going to work. So um, yes, yeah. I've got some students that this would be great. Well, no, not no, anymore. Not right? anymore. <laughs> so. Well, Kathy at least had her student teachers, teachers to bring yes. things to. So she packed her suitcase full of things for them. She did. Yes. <laughs> so, right. and then you guys, because I wanted, I I, uh, I forgot which of the companies had, like, the bugs and creepy crawlies, and there was this tarantula that was so fuzzy and cute. I wanted oh, to Oh, Carolina Biological. And, and, and Nicole, Carolina. And we said, you know, the last day, they don't bring those back with them. They give them away. Oh, and uh, Do they really? Yes. And Nicole said, well, like, I'm going to get that on the airplane. And so we gave her a present. Oh, a present! <laughs> hey. Well, I need someone to identify this for me. Bug girl, if you're watching, what is this? <laughs> I know you hate that question, but it's really cool, and it's a paperweight. And What's his name? I don't know. I haven't come up with a name yet. Her? Or her. I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to think of something. So, ah, creepy crawlies. Thank you, Ellen and Kathy. You guys are really <laughs> welcome. <laughs> um... That's, is there any last thoughts? Uh, we're coming up on an hour. Any last thoughts that you have on uh, the meeting itself or, or the science standards? Hmm. Uh, we're going to see how they go with um, assessment. That's my real interest. Hmm. And I think we'll definitely come back and revisit 
and GSS, just oh, a yes. whole topic. We'll uh, try and get, maybe we'll try and get some. There really is. There's a whole lot more. They are very complex, but um, lots of good stuff. And a lot of teachers are already doing exactly what the NGSS would like to see all mm -hmm. teachers and all students doing. So for a lot of people, it's not new, but um, for a lot of people, it is. And uh, we'll be back to talk more about it because there, it's really complicated. Um, yeah. Issue. If you have been involved in the NGSS process and would like to be on our show, <laughs> email educate at cosmoquest.org. Um, actually, I have a couple, at least one person in mind that we should invite to come talk about it because that would be really cool to hear it from the, the, the authors themselves. Um, if there's a writer out there listening to us who would like to share, that would be wonderful. Yes, yes. Um, all right, I think that's it for today's show. Thank you for watching Learning Space. Our next Google Hangout today is Wednesday. Our next Hangout is Thursday tomorrow at uh, noon Pacific. The Planetary Society do their Hangout on air. Uh, and then at noon Pacific on Friday, we do the uh, weekly Space Hangout. And we will be covering topics such as, did we find dark matter again, maybe? Um, can we capture an asteroid? And we will certainly cover the exoplanet news that is embargoed that will come out tomorrow. We'll talk about that on Friday. Um, so, so stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, that's our show. Captain Chuck okay. also went to NSTA, says hello. <laughs> I'm Captain Chuck. People love the squirrel. Um, so yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for joining Bye. me. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.